button and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you make comments or if your face is on the screen, you'll, you'll be on the video. <laughs> Good to go. All right. Well, welcome everyone to today's um, online meeting. We're very excited to have all of you here um, for our first meeting of 2018. And today we have a special guest, Michelle Cushera, who um, has been with Pickup for a few years now, um, attended the first um, summer workshop and uh, came back for the second summer workshop as a, as a coordinator. Um, but she's been doing some interesting things with pair programming at uh, Davidson College. And so um, we'll hear a few remarks from her and then open it up uh, to questions and comments. Um, and before I seat the floor, I actually also wanted to make an advertisement. If you pull up your chat, there's uh, a few different sessions on computation at this summer's AAPT meeting. There's one that I'm organizing, and so of course I'd like to highlight that one. Um, so please consider submitting an abstract. Uh, what we'd like to do is hear from different institutions on how they're trying to integrate computation throughout the curriculum with the idea that folks in the audience or other participants will be able to um, see different models, you know, maybe some, find something that fits their institution well. Um, so please consider that deadline is February 21st. All right, Michelle, all yours. All right, thank you. So I'm going to try and share my screen. I'm sure I'm going to do it wrong at first. So uh, let's see. Am I? No. Okay. Am I sharing a screen with you? No. Now? Yes, now you are. Okay. Oops, that doesn't have what we want. Okay, do you see the PowerPoint? Pair programming and physics courses. Yes. Okay, so yes, I'm going to talk about pair programming today, and I'm going to highlight how I do it in physics courses. And I teach in the computer science department as well, where pair programming is the norm in all of the classes here at Davidson College. Um, but I'll talk about more how I apply it in the physics classes. So um, if you don't know what pair programming is, um, these bullet points highlight it very well. And I have the link at the bottom as to where I got, uh, where I got this definition. And um, so it's a collaborative learning method where they program in pairs. And when we say program in pairs, we mean that there is one computer with two people working at it. And, um, and a lot of the uh, computer science pedagogy um, focuses around this because research has shown that um, it, in, it uh, increases retention, uh, it improves learning, although um, some of the, the links on the next slide are very interesting in how it does that. Um, but it's been shown to be very successful in learning computer science. And uh, so specifically, you have one person driving at a time and another person is the navigator. And you switch back and forth between those roles to finish a given task. And um, so this is the, the definition as given uh, by the computer scientists. And uh, I just linked to a couple papers. I don't know that these are like the papers in the field, but these are ones that I've read that uh, show some, some results from pair programming and computer science. And, um, and also it's really important to note that in uh, developer type positions in the real world, uh, pair programming exists for the same reasons that are outlined in these uh, research results. So you also get better products out, you get, uh, you get, you get your products faster than if you had two people work, working separately uh, towards the same goal, like different parts, for example. Um, so, so it is a successful model that's even crossed over into the workplace. <clears throat> so um, in physics, we can just think of this as being really similar to active learning. Like we know active learning works in physics pedagogy, and this is computer science's version of it. Um, but how, how I do it in class is what I call workshop style, style and I totally 
stole some of this from um, workshops that I've attended, like uh, computational workshops, high performance computing workshops. Um, but in those, you're typically coding solo, you're not pair programming. So what I do in class is I randomly assign partners whenever we have a, a computational task to solve. Um, and I want to note that that's not pedagogically backed. All the computer scientists here, they um, pair students based off of ability, and you're supposed to pair people of similar ability together. Um, so having really mismatched uh, pairs is not supposed to be great for the overall learning of both people, as you might imagine. But um, I really like randomly assigned partners throughout the semester um, for in-class work because that work is typically short. It overall helps the total time of completion for the class to not be really um, biased or really, really staggered. Um, and you can learn a lot from all different people. So I really like doing that, but that's not something that's, that's backed by research. Um, for me, I run a Python script to switch who's driving, and I'll show you that in a second at given intervals of time. And then if you see in the picture, I don't, it's hard to see because I took a picture, no one needed help, um, but I have these red post-its that someone puts, puts on their uh, screen if they need help, and then if they're totally done with that task, it's green, just indicating that, that to me that, that they're done. Um, and I encourage students who are done to help those that need it because um, uh, often if it's me and uh, 32 students or however many I have, it's hard to help everyone at once. And those that finish typically like to, to help the others. So that's how I do it in the classroom. Um, in my class, I'm often working through Jupyter Notebooks have explicit instructions in them. And uh, so in my physics classes, I pair program in the classroom or in the lab, depending on what class it is. In the intro classes, I, right now I'm just pair programming in the laboratory. Um, and in intro classes, I don't have any programming outside of the classroom or solo because uh, to me, in those classes, it's just to, uh, to enhance their learning and uh, like subtly teach them some programming along the way. Um, so at other upper level courses, we have a computational physics course that I teach. So um, in that class, they are coding at home um, consistent with our typical department homework rules, which are like some problems you can work with other people and some you work alone. And then in class, we pair program, uh, which is different from the computer science classes um, where we pair program for all work, including homeworks. <clears throat> And so just some basic observations is that um, the students overall appreciate and enjoy the in-class pair programming. Um, I don't really call it pair programming in the intro labs. Uh, I just call it like doing the lab because I tell them they don't have to learn to program even though they are. Um, but they typically really like that in the evaluations for all of the classes. And also you can really observe that they're learning and teaching each other in the classroom. And I do think that without pair programming, uh, that solo programming would be hard to support in the classroom. So for, class for classrooms, I would guess of, unless you have really small classes, it would be really hard to be able to help everyone and the pair programming helps with that a lot. And also eases difference in coding abilities because um, presumably in physics classes, you have people that are really into programming and know a lot and you have other people who are doing it because they have to. So, um, so the pair program really helps in, in easing those differences. So if you guys are interested, I'll show you my pair programming script that I use um, in the classroom. So do you guys see a Jupyter notebook right now? Okay, and I'm going to bring over Spider. <clears throat> so this is my pair programming script. And so if you see, I've ran it already and it lists the students in the class and it assigns them randomly to a pair and a table. And, um, and they, they typically like this because the class is in Python and this is in Python. So they know to go to that table and then, you know, I teach them for a while and then whenever we have a pair programming activity, then I just present her here and how much time they have to do it and then how much one turn is. Start coding. Did you guys hear that? 
So, uh, so it just is uh, auditory to, and it will have a timer. So every 0.2 minutes in this case, he will tell them to switch roles and then the driver switches. And so they get used to this pretty much after the first class. Um, although you have to tell them like, you can just move the keyboard, not like stand up and switch places. So, um, and then at the end they'll say time is up, but I'm just going to kill it. <clears throat> so that's, yeah, so that's the script that I run when we pair program in class and it works pretty well. If it gets really heated discussions and sometimes they don't pay attention and you have to yell that it's time to switch roles. And well, this is actually a lab that we did in class. This one did not, I've switched all my labs over to Jupyter Notebooks, but more typically um, they have a little bit of code and uh, some responses to add and things like that. So that's all I wanted to show you and hopefully you guys have some questions. I just posted a question into the chat. It's every 0 0.2 minutes they switch roles? No, not in real life. I was just doing that because I didn't want you guys to sit around for like five minutes before he told oh, you okay. switch roles. So, uh, so typically, I, it depends on how long the task is. So if it's a shorter task, I want to make sure each person has enough time uh, to get a chance to drive, which is where I think you learn the most. Um, but I typically do four minutes is what I like. That's my magic number, but there is, that is not research back. That's just observation, trial and error. Are there particular things you do to get the, the navigator to navigate effectively? and the driver to listen to the navigator effectively? No, I actually find that the pair programming pretty automatically without, uh, just with the rules of one person can be touching the computer and the mouse at once works really well. And you even see like, um, maybe people who think that they're stronger aren't as strong as they realize. And you see people also giving little tips, like, do you know you can click control S to save or this, you know, just little, little like tips you can see people give when, like I call it itchy fingers when like you really want to touch the keyboard, but you can't. Uh, that's when I think some of the best uh, collaboration happens, but I don't see any, any, uh, you don't need to develop that skill in them. It's a little different if you're telling them to pair program at home for homework, but I don't do that in the physics classes. That's, that's like way more of a challenge to do that effectively. So Michelle, yes. I, I'm wondering, um, so one of the things I've noticed is, um, you know, you have students at the intro level and they do whatever you ask, but then at the upper level, they often, act like, you know, they don't remember any of their coding or their skills with Python. And I was wondering if you noticed that is the pair interaction um, able to get them more independent quicker, quicker or more quickly become um, better at it? <laughs> yeah, so I think what the research shows is that you're, you're able to like finish a difficult task faster or or um, accomplish something quicker. Uh, but I don't know that it's showing that you're, you're like retaining it longer or something like that. Um, I will say, so right now our advanced lab students are now a mix of people who have had me and pair programmed in Python and people who have um, had another professor that is using a different language. And uh, so the, the language of the instructor has changed or the faculty member to like, instead of like, you know, model this in uh, EJS, like whatever language you know best and you see people like come to me like, oh, I remember we did this in computational or, you know, they, they are eager to get back to something that they've done uh, in the classroom before or like kind of remember it. So I don't know the answer to that, but I am, I haven't seen any people bummed about coding after 
going through, like they would go through intro, doing a little bit of coding if they have me in lab, and then computational physics is in their sophomore year. And then we're hoping that they are using it in uh, classical mechanics and advanced lab for sure. They're required to, and hopefully a little bit in quantum. So how long is a class and how long is an activity? Yeah, that, that definitely depends. So like a computational, cla computational class, I change to Tuesday, Thursday so that we have more time in class at once so we can do more of these activities without them going over. And so when I had that class Monday, Wednesday, Friday, my first year here, you know, it was hard to get through a lecture in an activity. Uh, it seems to be working really well Tuesday, Thursday. And then in the intro classes, um, I do it in the lab. So we have three hour lab blocks. And uh, this semester I've decreased the, um, the uh, like lab write up portion by having them do the whole lab in Jupyter Notebook so they have more time in class for the programming. So there has to be some, some give and take there. When doing it in the lab for the intro classes, um, what fraction of time would you say is spent doing computational things versus experimental measurements? And have you gotten pushback uh, for taking time away from experimental measurements? Pushback? Oh, that's a, that's a pushback from who? Students Colleagues? Or faculty? Yeah, faculty. Okay, yeah. I would say um, the faculty I asked a few people that I thought would really care if how they felt about it, and uh, and then the rest of the people I told, um, and I don't I don't know that everyone's one hundred percent on board, and a lot of people are like are like you can do this for the second semester, but not the first. So like adding like for the first semester, have one of the goals be writing a full lab report, and that would take the whole semester of practicing. And so for the second semester, then I can do what I want. Um, I will say that this semester, moving them all into Jupyter Notebooks, one thing I've seen that I was really surprised by is people finishing later parts, seeing that they have time left in lab and going back and doing other parts of the experiments again. And that could be two reasons. One, I've given them more time to actually do the lab because they, or they feel like they have more time because so they're not writing a full lab report. But also our lab reports were handwritten. So like once you've gone past a certain part, then you kind of don't want to go back and rewrite that section because you'd have to like re erase it or, or, or rewrite that section on a new piece of paper or something. So maybe it's just easier with how, it's, how it is set up in the Jupyter Notebook. But I have seen people spending more time on the experiment uh, now that it's set up this way. But we'll see about the faculty pushback. They all know. No, no one, no one's told me no for second semester. I'm curious about the the pair programming in the upper level classes. Um, I thought where Linda was going with her question was that intro students tend to follow directions a lot better than upper level students in the sense that you know probably when the thing says switch the intro level students would switch uh -huh. whereas the upper level students might ignore it so i'm wondering if you get pushback from the students in in some of your classes about you know not wanting to switch so quickly or um yeah so i think different. yeah i think for me i can really only speak to computational physics class which we have like sophomores through seniors just because of how it's, how it's worked out the past couple of years. But um, my hope would be that, although I guess right now I'm teaching algebra-based second semester and we're mostly juniors and senior chemistry majors and pre-med, um, they are fine with it. Uh, but I don't know, I guess you'll see, but my hope is that they're used, they'll be used to it 
So if you if they would do it in classical, so I was supposed to teach classical this year, but I was unable to. Um, I teach modern next semester. My hope is that they've seen it and that's how we do it. So they just keep doing it that way. So I was gonna ask Michelle, what are the things I'm pretty anal about um, because it, it sort of ties into our goal of having students be able to communicate what they're doing and why is the commenting. Um, you know, so I really would hope that students knew that's an important part of the coding. And I'm wondering if this rush to get a, the task done and using a Jupyter notebook, whether you feel like you've lost anything and whether maybe I should give up <laughs> wanting them to comment on their code or <laughs> oh I'm anal about that too but I would say that like in my computational physics class there you get plenty of points by doing the entire problem wrong but having very appropriate program structure and comments and dot strings and everything like that you have the whole right setup then then you've got yourself some points so I focus on that in the computational physics class, but that's that's a part of my learning goal there is for them to know how to write good software. Um, I, at the intro classes, I just say, there's this thing called code and it, you know, like you don't have to learn how to program, but really like add this code that does this thing here. And I, kind of, I don't focus on programming practice in intro level. But you have to choose, choose your battles, I think. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm late. did you say intro level? Is that calculus-based physics one, or is this algebra-based? Uh, both, uh, except okay. really I'm talking about second semester because that's where they've let me do the most coding. So algebra-based, okay. Uh, or calculus and algebra based second semester is where I've done the most in the intro level. So, so E and M stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I would like to do it equally as much in sure. in the first semester. Yeah, I I've posted some of some introductory activities uh, based on JavaScript to the pickup site. Uh, nice. My, my activities are very interactive, and so it has things like Asteroids game and Angry Birds and things like that. Mm -hmm. so my, my, my impression is that Visual Python is not very interactive, is that you tend not to interact with the program once it's run. Um, that's not always true, but... Uh, yeah, I have trouble with interaction in Jupyter Notebooks with script, but like uh, my trinkets, I make clicky and draggy if that's what you mean by interactive. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a feature of the Python. You can't actually push two, two keyboard keys at the same time, which makes... Oh, uh, if you're doing, like, gaming type right. stuff, yeah. 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 Obviously, I'm the first person to have thought of this, but, you know, <laughs> it's important to me. Yeah. Well, I do you guys know about... Okay, I'm sorry this is a little off topic, but I got really excited about today. The Matplotlib animation package. It's so beautiful. I don't know why I didn't know about it. And I think it's been around for a long time. So anyways, check it out because I've been excited about it. Got it working in Jupyter Notebooks today. So I'm curious, there's... 16 participants it's showing right now. Um, I'm curious whether anybody else has tried having their students program in either pairs or larger groups and um, how that compares to what Michelle has been talking about. I'll jump in right quick. No, I, I haven't, uh, but it, it sounds intriguing. It would be a, a good thing to try. Um, tend to have them just work on their own, and so then they all start to diverge out. Uh, I can see how having them work together and then swapping is a really good idea, so I, I think that'll be a good thing to try. So, so the students in my intro class, the, the, the tables are arranged so that there's four to a table, 
So they're all submitting their own code, but they, they tend to collaborate in fours just because of the geometry of the classroom. That seems to work okay. Uh, I had a quick question about the, the nature of the electromagnetism exercises, and I apologize, I, I came in late, but is it heavily 3D or is it mostly uh, two-dimensional uh, kind of projections? Because Visual Python can do either one. I'm just curious which, which activities are actually being used. Wait, what are you asking about? Uh, what kind of activities did you use? I'm really sorry I came in late, but... Was was it heavily 3D activities, or was it things that were basically in a 2D plane? Oh, uh, I've done, so, mainly 2D, but I've done a 3D activity where you can move charges in three dimensions in VPython. Okay. For the so, intro, right? So is it basically straight out of matter interactions, or was it something else? No, we don't use matter interactions here, unfortunately. Okay. Is it on the pickup site what you did? No, but I should put it there. I see I Larry a, smiling. I have a, I, well, I've probably been saying that for two years. Well, I have a GitHub um, page with all my computational physics materials on it, and I should probably make one for my intro materials um, and some exercises. Sure. So I, I was curious. Um, do people, maybe Michelle, you can start to answer this, but do other people put computational things on their tests in the intro course? Um, because we've started to do that. And I, I think it's made people aware that when they are in lab and coding, that everybody needs to know what they're doing. Um, now we don't do the pair thing, but we have partners, kind of like what Chris was saying. Um, so there are two people at a table with two computers and they're working side by side and they're constantly talking to each other. They, they each have to submit their own code, but they, they share. If one person is seeing an error, then the other person tries to fix it. You know, they'll send it back and forth through um, the uh, online communicator system. Um, and we really find that by letting them know that there could be a coding question on a, a test, that they, they kind of ah, perk up. Um, and I'm wondering if that's a good idea to put things like that on tests. Well, I, I think that uh, you have to be careful because anything that's related to the coding activity, unless it's immediately before and after they finish the coding activity, it, you're always going to be unclear whether they got that question right because of the coding activity or because just, you know, luck or something else. So I, I tend to think assessment is best uh, immediately after, immediately before and immediately after they, they finish the, the assignment. One thing we should all work on together, I think, is some kind of assessment uh, group of questions, uh, preferably animated, that one hopes that coding activities, and whether it's Intro mechanics or ENM that students would be able to answer better. Um, I, that's more questions than answers, but I, I think that's what we should strive for. For the question of whether or not to test on computation in intro physics, um, I know that's something that Marie has talked about before. If you'd be interested in jumping in, Marie. Well, I haven't tested them in introductory physics. I've tested them in sophomore level and above just because of the the population of students and how much time we have um, for tests. So at the intro level, I'm doing something very similar to what Michelle is doing. We're just having it, some computation in lab, um, very guided, just you know, to, to get them a little bit thinking about how computation works and how it can help us solve problems that we can't solve paper and pencil, um, and, and to have some you know, fun visualization activities. So I've, I've done the, um, the falling sphere with the parabolic throw, and I've done the, the Mars mission, which they, they really, really like. Um, but sophomore level and above, um, I find that they tend to take the coding and the lab 
uh, much more seriously and to really focus on what the goals are if I tell them that I'm going to include something on the exams. And so, um, and it's, it's worked really well. They're usually an extension of something they've done before. So, you know, they're not starting from scratch. They have a, a script that they've already written and they just have to modify it in some way. Um, and I, it really highlights the need for good comments on their code, which I love, right? Because if you ask them to change something and they don't know where that something is in their code, um, after the, you know, even during the first exam, I can tell them, it's like, well, is there a comment somewhere that says, you know, this is where the code is checking for X. Um, and, and, you know, that, that really gets them thinking about code being something that you reuse and not something that you do and put away. Um, so I, I, I think it's worked pretty well. So I had a question about your groups. So what happens since you pick these groups at random, if you have partners where one person's been coding since first grade and the other person hasn't touched the computer? Yeah, so I think that for the small in-class activities, that actually is a totally fine pairing. Uh, I think that that would not work for assigning longer term projects or homework activities for pair programming if you're interested in doing that. And I mean, uh, I think that, that anyone can give anecdotal evidence that that doesn't work. But in the class, if it's like a 20 minute uh, to 30 minute exercise, which usually mine are, then uh, that, that I think the, I think the person who had never touched a computer is going to learn a lot. And typically for shorter assignments, the more experienced person is not mad about teaching someone else something, uh, typically enjoys it. And, uh, and if the, if the pair is really good and finishes quickly, I, I kind of like seeing when they want to like help other people that are struggling as well. And sometimes that worst person, not worse, but less experienced, uh, will get kind of get a, a boost of encouragement that they know what they're doing too. So I don't see an issue with randomly pairing in the classroom. Uh, if you always had that dichotomy, I bet there would be issues though. And we see it with homeworks. If you, if you accidentally pair people that way, we don't try to. And you're also switching every class period, is that right? So, so you know, even if even if the the one pair was really imbalanced, next time they get somebody else, right? So it it wouldn't be for long. Right. Exactly. I think that's why I don't didn't see any complaints off of it. Um, even though that's not recommended, it's because it was short and only one class at a time. If I notice a really imbalanced pair and then randomly they get paired again the next week, I was like rerun the script. So that they get pairs with someone else, uh, but yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't think it's a big deal. I would say in my classes, the more experienced coders really do not mind helping less experienced coders. I, I think that they enjoy it on some level. Certainly, they don't look annoyed. So let me ask a related question then. So the standard scale-up model, you have three people in the group and you're supposed to have a strong, middle, and weak person. Is this saying we're doing that wrong? I think that, I think, I mean, it is related, right? It's similar, but I, I don't think that you can compare the two. They both have been researched, right? So, uh, I don't know. Michelle, would you be able to easily give us a, a quick um, listing of what the activities are that, that you've been doing in your intro e &M. So how many of them are there? Um. Yeah, so we've only had, so this semester, my third lab is this week. 
So I would say that we've, and I've only had one, I have one computational activity per class. So the first, the very first one was just working through a Jupyter notebook, learning what variables are, like where I tell them not to code and then teach them what py the Python programming language. Then the next one was uh, editing the trinket, so the Jupyter notebook linked to a trinket because of the interaction issue. And it showed, that's the one I showed when I was there as, uh, you know, at the workshop as a student, where you show the force uh, due to all the surrounding charges, you can make as many charges as you want, move them all around, show the net force on each charge due to all the others. Uh, the next one, oh, we're finding equipotential lines. I am modifying the code that I worked with someone at the workshop last semester with that was uh, his, um, where you can set up a charge distribution and it will draw the equipotential lines. So uh, just all small little ones in there and I'm kind of editing those as we go since I this is the first semester I've ported everything to Jupyter Notebooks in that class. And then will things change when you get to circuits? Yeah that's <laughs> that's where I had trouble last year uh, when we got to circuits there wasn't as much to show or to visualize maybe. Um, but since the whole, I found that since I'm porting everything to Jupyter Notebooks, you can find little things to calculate or show. So I don't know if there'll be an actual visualization or anything, but maybe, maybe a solver that can solve, uh, that can solve a more complicated circuit easily without all the work to do it by hand. In progress. Do you have any ideas for me? Uh, discharging RC circuit is, is probably the simplest circuit problem that a computer can do well. Because in an algebra-based class, they don't understand the calculus derivation of how that works. But every line of that code, they can understand from an algebra-based perspective. And then you can show the, the current uh, die-off over time. So there's something to look at. And, yes. And you, can have the, you can have the switch flip from one side to another. And things. So, so well, I think I put that activity on, on pickup in JavaScript, but maybe it'd be cool to have a, a Visual Python variant of it or something. Awesome. I'm going to look that up. But what I don't have is, is equipotential lines and things like that. So that's, that would be kind of cool to have. Yeah, there was a really cool one that someone did at the workshop last summer that, um, I kind of stole. I don't think he posted it because uh, mm -hmm. he was working in my group. It was great. Maybe I can tell him to post it. Is anyone trying to put uh, like coding tutorials on YouTube? You know, just kind of posting up there. I mean, the Pickup has a YouTube channel now that, that Danny put up there a week or two ago, but. Um, uh, is there any YouTube content that I don't know about? I mean, it seems like there's very little. Larry, are you putting anything on YouTube? No? I, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of people that are apprehensive about doing coding in the intro classes, and uh, having more YouTube resources could help with that. I, I've started to put some things up, but I really don't want them to go public. They're bad. Um, but we are planning to develop more of those. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's in the works. <laughs> uh, it's an incredible amount of work to make good videos. <laughs> we, oh, you yeah, don't have to we tell me. I'm in web design, but I never made any that made it online. Yeah, it's tough. So. So the STEM coding project has a YouTube channel that uh, we have, I think 15 videos on there now. And most of the activities are also uh, listed on pickup. So over the weekend I was doing a lot of editing of the wave interference 
cutting activity. Um, there's there's a moment where we had to like erase the screen, so I like put it to music just to make it a little bit more watchable. Otherwise, it was 15 solid minutes of uh, whiteboard derivations on <laughs> these, which is which I believe is why they invented the 1.5 times playback speed on YouTube. I think that's the only way that makes that remotely watchable. Um, but we're going to keep working on that. And if, if people have YouTube videos on coding that they want, that they'd like me to post there, I'm happy to I'm happy to put that there. Um, so I, it doesn't necessarily have to be just an OSU thing that we post. And then he just posted a link on the um, chat that uh, goes to Chris's YouTube channel for if you're interested in going over there and watching uh, those videos. Yeah, the, the short link is uh, the short link is go.osu.edu slash stem tube with lowercase t-u-b-e, which is a little bit more memorable than uh, <laughs> the other way. Um, UCXXG was. <laughs> huh. Well, we have about 17 ish minutes left. Um, and it's a new semester. So uh, perhaps we should go around and maybe say a little bit about uh, what everybody's up to this semester and if they have any you know, interesting computational things that they're trying. Um, it'd, be, it'd be good to hear. I'll jump in because I don't have much to say. Um, so I'm teaching a uh, sophomore level electronics class. And so basically it's a um, review of some of the stuff that you'd see in your second semester calculus based course and then getting into some more um, digital electronics. Uh, I haven't quite figured out how to incorporate more computation into that course yet. This is the first time I'm teaching it. Um, I'm also teaching the second semester of the algebra-based uh, physics for life sciences. And those folks have a hard time with unit conversions. They're not going to do any computation. So that's kind of where I'm at. I will say my 220 class, there's like, it's it's a lot of people who who were not tech savvy at all. They hadn't even heard of zip, like zip files, like unzipping and zipping before. But when I told them that this was the small price to pay for not write, handwriting lab reports, they, they like dove right in. <laughs> I had an experience last semester with first semester freshmen where I was amazed at just how hard it was to get them to zip something. <laughs> Wow, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, this semester in my upper level thermal physics class, uh, I had a really good uh, experience last week with computational work in there um, that I had them, I, I gave them an assignment and the first thing I told them to do was read through this and write a little bit about what you're gonna do. And they did that before the next class and they didn't do a good job of it, but they at least, looked at it and thought a little bit. And in the next class in uh, groups at the board, they talked through and wrote out pseudocode and listed variables and what data types they would have. Um, and then they actually uh, worked, on the worked on writing code for the assignment before the next class meeting. And that went really well. And they all had done really good things. Um, so the timing worked out correctly there of making good use of in-class time and out-of-class time. I found that difficult to get the moments right for in class and out of class. Hi, I'm Danielle McDermott. This is actually my first time to the meeting and it was my first day teaching for the semester. So I've been very quiet, but I'm teaching computational physics for the first time. And I'd been a teaching assistant in it before a long time ago. And that class used the pair programming model. And I was so glad to know about it 
which is one of the reasons I decided to come tonight, of course, is to hear this. And with one day in, I was really happy with the students. They're used to working in small groups. Uh, they do the workshop physics curriculum here at Pacific University. And so they start with Excel spreadsheets their very first semester, just like um, we have some examples of on the Pickup website. And so they were just switching back and forth. Uh, and our biggest struggle, I think, is I'm teaching them GitHub as well. And so I would love to hear some advice on how you do that, but if anyone has any. Danny does. Yeah, I, um, so I'm, right now I'm teaching um, advanced DNM2 for uh, physics and astronomy majors. Um, and uh, I've taught that course using um, GitHub Classroom and this semester just using GitHub uh, by itself for the students who are responsible for their own repositories. Um, GitHub Classroom was uh, useful from my end. Um, it was a nightmare for the students because they had to basically keep track of each sort of assignment um, and they ended up with, you know, at the end of the semester, 15 repositories, each one for each assignment, which is not the point of a repository. Um, so this year what we're doing is, uh, they are responsible for their own repository and they add me as a collaborator. And the only thing that I really had to do was, um, show them where to add me as a collaborator. And I think that's a change this year because, um, our, uh, majors are now required to take an introduction to, um, computational modeling, um, in our, in our, um, Department of Computational Math, Science, and Engineering. And in the second semester version, of, second semester of that course, um, the entire course is taught using um, GitHub repositories. And okay. so I think probably somewhere between about 50 to 75% of my students have taken that course. Um, so very few of them had any questions about how any of that worked. Um, whereas the previous semester I had to spend you know, uh, the first two weeks or so with some of the students trying to, you know, kind of remind them how all that works. I never actually taught it formally in class. Uh, I just took it on a case by case basis because the class was so small. Okay. Um, so when you have them do their own repositories, you have them go and make them and then fork reposit or the repository that you have created with the assignments in them, or how do you do that workflow? Uh, so the students that are taking the second semester course took my first semester course, so they, they did a lot of scaffolded computing on their own. Um, so I gave them stuff to do and they would, they would um, you know, do their calculations and then they would turn it into a, a Dropbox file request. Because um, in that class, uh, I have anywhere from 60 to 80 students taking e m one for physics and astro majors, so I'm not going to try to debug all of that. Uh, this this course I only have 16 students um, and so uh, I don't actually give them any code anymore um, they are responsible for writing everything on their own okay so, um, I just tell them that at the beginning of the course that they've you know they've done this through through you know through the whole semester last semester and so now I'm not going to give them any more code they just have to do it okay so are these public repositories Danny uh, yes, they probably are, uh, unless the student, um, ha already sort of registered their education discount with GitHub and was able to secure private repositories. So do you have any worry? Because GitHub Classroom, to me, the main benefit, I didn't like the repository per assignment issue, but the private ones meant that not everyone saw each other's work. So now, presumably, people could just check out what everyone's doing. Yeah. Do you think I that's don't, an issue? Uh, so I don't police that, and I don't care. Um, if they're shortcutting their work, that's really on them. Um, very, I, I've not had that experience. Uh, and when they turn in their code, it's pretty obvious that they're not. Um, Danielle, what book do you use in computational physics? I'm using Mark Newman's book. 
I am. Um, That's what I used to. I, I have a lot of session documents that outline the pair programming, but they're all in LaTeX and PDF. And so I'm converting them all to Jupyter Notebooks right now. So it's interesting because I hadn't used a Jupyter Notebook until a month ago, and now I feel like an expert. What was that? What was it that you're using on that? Ah, Mark Newman's computational physics. It's the one with the red cover. Okay. So I told my students the reason I picked it is because it's physics greatest hits. Because he's got a problem about everything and it's encapsulated in a way that each the students don't have to have a lot of background knowledge to, to get to do those problems and think about those ideas. Yeah, I love that book. Great. Um, well, does anybody have any last comments or questions? Um, I have one. So I haven't done any program, but we're actually going to hire a computational physicist for the fall tenure track full time. Know anybody? Uh, we haven't got the job announcement out yet, so I don't know if it's actually gonna happen this fall, but it will happen in the fall or spring. Where are you at? North Carolina A and T in Greensboro. Uh, I was gonna, I was just gonna jump in and say that uh, so for the JavaScript based activities, um, you know, you don't have to, uh, personally, I, I, I tend to think that, that setting up Jupyter notebooks and things like that is fairly complicated. I remember I went to the Cleveland workshop and they couldn't actually get the Jupyter notebook working initially and it took like 20 or 30 minutes to get it going. Uh, so what we, what we do for the JavaScript based activities it, it's a little easier because you know browsers think in JavaScript these days, and so we have this site called semcoding.osu.edu that uh, most of the activities are set up in, and so you just kind of log in. The students complete the code in the browser, and then they submit it, and you get to see it in sort of a grid, so you can give quick feedback, and so you never have to deal with GitHub. You never have to configure any of that, that stuff. Um, it, it's, it's not a perfect site, but it works works well enough and we're continuing to develop it um, so I wanted to say that the other thing I, I'm working on is I'm I'm starting to think about creating sort of chemistry activities um, you know things like ideal gas laws and things like that and uh, you know, it turns out that a lot of high school physics teachers also teach chemistry so I have an outreach project to work with high school physics teachers and so and there's a lot of high school physics teachers that have chemistry degrees that ended up teaching physics by accident. And so a lot of them are really interested to see chemistry activities for ideal gas law, chemical equilibrium, things like that. So, I'll, so if anybody would like to, to pitch in with that, uh, I'd love some help. Okay. Hi, this, this is Axel. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yep, okay, because I'm uh, at a conference sitting in a hotel lobby, so this is not the most ideal place. Um, but I'd just like to briefly share my experience using NB Grader, which I uh, used uh, for the first time this uh, spring. So I, I posted uh, a little summary on uh, Slack uh, uh, about a week ago. So. What I like is uh, it really makes it easy to distribute uh, uh, the Jupyter Notebook assignments to the students. Um, it's easy to have an instructor version and a student version, keeping them in sync. Um, Autograding, uh, I use it for some questions. It works uh, pretty well and uh, can be a big time saver. Um, and also that the manual grading works pretty well. 
but it also still has a, a has a few rough spots. Uh, uh, it's not really designed uh, well, for example, for for a lab course with uh, multiple sections. Um, the the web interface uh, lacks some functionality, although you you can get by with the command line tools. So overall, um, I'm pretty happy with it. I, I think uh, I'll probably continue using it. All right. Well, thank you for sharing, Alex. We'll try to finish on time. Um, so I'd like to thank Michelle and for her presentation and everybody else for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again in the next um, online community meeting, uh, which will happen in February. Um, date to be announced. Um, and also, um, again, one more advertisement for submitting uh, abstracts to the AAPT. And also, if you have any um, colleagues interested in um, attending the week-long workshop at the uh, University of Wisconsin River Falls this summer, the application is now online, and so you should encourage folks to apply. Okay. Bye. Bye, folks. <laughs>